Hi, everyone. Today, we are talking with Jamie and Katie, who are the co-authors of the Self and Match system. So welcome, guys. Welcome. Hi, nice to see you. So for those people who maybe aren't familiar with you or the Self and Match system, can you tell us a little bit about you? Absolutely. So I'm Jamie Salter. I'm based in San Diego, California, and I'm half of the co-authors of the Self and Match system. A little bit about me. I am trained as a school psychologist, and I'm also trained as a board-certified behavior analyst. And I served in both of those capacities, as well as an autism specialist for about eight years. And then I spent 10 years as an administrator in special education. So I supported school districts in developing least restrictive environment settings for students. I worked with them on developing self match systems. I worked with them on developing all sorts of supports within classrooms. And then these last two years, since the pandemic hit, and since my children, um, I was juggling work and life and self and match, which is our nights and weekends project. I've been working full time consulting with school districts and training internationally on the self and match system. And I'll let Katie introduce herself and we can tell you a little bit more about self and match. Yeah. So hi, I'm Katie Croce, and I am a board certified behavior analyst. I have been working as a behavior analyst since 2006, and I have worked in public schools, non-public schools, uh, inpatient hospitals, in homes. Uh, I've worked at a clinic in a university setting, setting up social skills programs and sports programs and kids night out programs and summer camp programs all using the principles of behavior analysis, which was very cool. Uh, And now I work at a university. I'm full-time faculty in a school of education in Rutherford, New Jersey. It's called Felician University. And I teach applied behavior analysis to undergraduate and graduate students. And in my nights and weekends, I get to do self and match. Okay, so tell us a little bit about self and match. Absolutely. So We could tell you the whole history of how we got started, but before we do, we should probably tell you what it is. It's an evidence-based self-monitoring system that's been manualized. So we know self-monitoring is a tried and true intervention. We know it's something that's been proven since before we were born as an intervention. But what Katie and I would see is we would go to conferences, we would go to workshops, and we would hear all the different trainings that were out there, but self-monitoring wasn't necessarily the first one in people's toolbox. And and it's still not the first tool in in behavior analyst toolbox. And what we did was we synthesized all the research on self-monitoring, all the research with self-monitoring that involves an accountability component, that match component, that check-in. And we'll talk later about how many different systems you see out there that have those match components. And we manualized it in a way where people can pick it up, a behavior analyst can pick it up, an RBT can pick it up, a teacher can pick it up, a school psychologist can pick it up, and implement a systematic self-monitoring system. Katie, do you want to tell a little bit more about how it works? Sure. Um, There's a really simple procedure that goes along with the self and match system. So it's really just five basic steps. So the first step is that we... Uh, the student identifies if a behavior occurred. And so we always say, when we say behavior, we don't always mean challenging behavior. It could be an academic behavior, executive functioning skill, social skill, something that we want to see an area of improvement in. And they identify if it occurred or it didn't occur. And then the staff person who is with them also reflects on that. Did that behavior occur or didn't occur? And then we look for matches. So we look to see if there was a yes match. So yes, the student or client said yes, and the teacher or staff said yes. And if there's a yes match, they get two points. They get at least two points. One point because they engage in the expected behavior, and then one point because they honestly self-reflected. If we look at the matches and there's a no match, the student said no and the staff said no, they still get one point because they honestly self-reflected. And so that's an opportunity for us to pause and say, gosh, Jamie, like I recognize that you didn't uh, use kind words. What could we do different next time? And so it's an opportunity for a teachable moment. And it's also an opportunity for staff to continue to provide praise, even when there is a corrective moment, right? So that they can say, no, I, don't, I know we didn't do this exactly as planned, but what can we do different next time? We found a lot of interventions that we were seeing in school settings in particular were very adult directed. It's like, you didn't do this, you didn't do this, right? And it's easy to say those things, but we're not telling them what they should be doing. And so that's what we really wanted to focus on. And we also wanted students to learn that no is not always a bad thing. No is an opportunity to grow because we all have clients that sometimes get 
you know, a little nervous when they hear that N-O word. And so we wanted to teach them that no isn't always bad. Um, And then after we compare answers, then we add up their points and that at some point in time, they get access to a reinforcer. And so for every student, every client that is completely individualized, some of the students and clients we support get a reinforcer after every single time that they self-monitor. Some of them only get it once a day, some once a week, and some even less than that. So it's extremely individualized. Absolutely. And Katie, something that um, I just wanted to point out and hop on with what you just explained is some people are like, well, why would you need like a 150 page, 200 page manual to go through those five steps that you shared? And I think you're absolutely right that the core of self and match are those five steps, the self-reflection, the checking in and matching with an adult, the um, looking for those um, areas we can self-improve and change. Um, the other crux of this intervention, and I think what makes it stand out from other interventions, is the systematic planning guide that's also associated with the manual. So you're not just saying, oh, here's a form, Sarah, here's a form, Johnny, but there's so much pre-planning. That concept's kind of a working smarter, not harder. We're really thinking through every single what if of the intervention before you start it. So you're thinking through um, what are the questions going to be? How are we going to phrase them positively? How are we going to make sure there's only a certain amount of questions? What will the rewards be? How do we make sure those rewards are matching the student's function of behavior? What, how are we going to feed the system? What do we do if the student leaves early, comes late, refuses to fill out the form? I just gave away a lot of our secrets, but I can tell you there's a lot (laughs) more on that form, but that's what gets you to the individualized form. It's not about the piece of paper. It's about the planning that's done collaboratively with a team before you roll out the intervention. And Jamie, I love that you said that because so many times I'll go into a school or I'll even go into, you know, camp setting or something to consult and, you know, they may be using a token board and we switch it to a behavior contract. And then eventually we want to switch it to self-monitoring, but, you know, people will say, oh, look, I just have this piece of paper. This is okay to use. Right. And it's the same piece of paper for this kid versus that kid or the same menu of reinforce. I'm putting reinforcers in quotation marks Mm -hmm. because they're not Mm -hmm. really reinforcers if they're not increasing future likelihood of behavior. Um, but it's the same menu for everybody. And yeah. uh, without that planning piece, that's what you get is that cookie cutter self-monitoring approach. Is it really self-monitoring? I guess it would be, but it's not effective. Um, that's why if you can have a team meeting, multiple team meetings to mm-hmm. review this and sit down with your team and say, hey, here's some questions. There's no right or wrong answer, but it definitely helps us come up with our end goal. I love that piece. Totally. And that's like a structured interview, you know, like let's sit down with a piece of paper and let's go through this. And, you know, because I came through both a school psych program and a behavior analytic program, there was so much talk about that consultation, us going in as behavior specialists and behavior, you know, as um, analysts and saying like, I'm not just going to give you this, but I want to ask you, what do you think is going to be doable? Because we know if the teachers have that voice and the teachers have a say, and and if you can weave in what the teachers are already doing. So if they already have a buck system or a store system or a marble jar, how do we weave that into what we're going to do, but make sure it's still empirically sound? And that's like key for us. And something else that you mentioned that I think is so key is that concept of um, having a different form to match each student's needs. And, and in our manual, there's 18 different examples. And then there's so many more on our online portal. But the reason we do that is because we want to show if you're working with a preschooler, it will look different than a high schooler. If you're working with a student that has um, a, a more academic needs, it'll look different. Katie, maybe you want to share a little bit about how that how that looks yeah. different sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we think about from that inception, that uh, beginning of that consultation process, when we go through that considerations guide, you know, what are their academic needs? Are they readers? Are they non-readers? If they're non-readers, then we incorporate more visual supports on there for them. If they're non-readers, we also will probably teach them the difference between the expected and unexpected behaviors a little bit differently. If they have some early math skills, then that's great. But if they don't, it doesn't mean that they can't use the system also because we can put in visual supports where we can show them similar to like a token economy where they're getting closer and closer and closer. We, you know, we circle stars, we can fill up a a thermometer to like show you're getting closer to your goal. We can give them those visual resources that they need, even if they don't have those pre-math skills. And then for the older students, we can even incorporate 
higher level math skills, right? Where we can say, now, guess what? You are going to take your points and you're going to graph them, or you're going to take your points and you're going to add them to your bank account and, you know, teach them how to do some simple, um, like managing your checkbook. Those are all life skills that we can incorporate into this system. And I think the other thing, when I think about like other areas that we pull into self and match is that sometimes we have multiple systems running at the same time. We have a visual schedule and we have a point sheet and we have their token board and we have, you know, all of these things. Uh, but with self and match, you can really build that all into one. You could put their visual schedule right on their form. So you're just having to have one resource instead of multiple resources, which makes life a little bit easier for folks who are supporting students. But Jamie, the other thing that I was thinking about, the beauty of having a school psychologist that helped to create self and match is that consultation piece. Because I think that's one of the things for us as behavior analysts that we don't really focus on in depthly in our coursework of becoming a behavior analyst is that consultation. And we are guests when we come into people's schools or homes or classrooms, even if you work for the district, you're going into a teacher's classroom, it's their classroom. And so you have to remember that when you walk in that you won't be able to just be like, here's what I want you to do, right? Even if we have an idea in our head, we still have to pair with our staff that we're working with the same way that we pair with our students. And so having that consultation model from psychology and school psychologists built into this, I think makes it so much more powerful because we really teach behavior analysts who may not get a lot of training in consultation, how to do this and do it really well. Hmm. So would you say that this could be appropriate for any level student or are there some other, you know, prerequisite skills or what type of student or setting is this really ideal for, or maybe mm -hmm. not ideal for? Yeah, that's such a great question. Katie, why don't you take it first? Yeah, sure. So the beauty of self-monitoring is there is so much research on self-monitoring. Almost any type of individual that you support, you probably can find research showing that self-monitoring can be effective. Some of the most basic research with self-monitoring was, was with individuals that had intellectual disabilities. And so sometimes we have people ask us, you know, my classroom that I support or the students that I support have intellectual disabilities, they won't be able to self-monitor. And that's not true at all individuals with intellectual disabilities can learn how to self-monitor, but it's all in the way you individualize it. And it's all in the way that you teach them the skills. And so when we train people, we tell them the same way that you teach colors, the same way that you teach shapes, the same way that you teach to discriminate between an A and a B is the same way that you teach expectations and the questions that are on the form. Um, just through simple discrimination training. Is this an example or a non-example? And you can say, you know, match to same, right? It's it's as simple as that, um, but it takes time. And so for some of those learners, they need more intensive instruction on what's expected and not expected or a green choice or a red choice or, you know, whatever language you use in your programs. But it's the same exact teaching procedures that we would teach them to discriminate between letters and numbers, colors, shapes, et cetera. So what we have found, though, the only types of behaviors that we say maybe shy away from if you're using self-monitoring are behaviors like stealing or lying, because if they're really good at those things, you won't know it, about it until much later. Um, so those are the ones that we shy away from a little bit. And Katie, I also wanted to just jump in and also say that um, we are so fortunate that there's such a, a deep long research base on self-monitoring as interventions. Self-monitoring has been researched since the 70s, um, or maybe even before the 1970s. But um, self and match also has research coming out more and more each year. And one of the research studies was that came out was through San Diego State, Dr. Lucy Eamesman and Dr. Roy Mayer. And what was neat about their research on self and match is they implemented it in an early intervention classroom. So we're talking about preschoolers using self and match and using self monitoring. So I know Katie was talking about some of the precursors, but it's neat to see that as long as you're doing what Katie said and you're doing it really systematically and you're really um, simplifying the forms to meet their levels and systematically teaching the expectations so that they know what's expected of them, you can see self-monitoring with really young children. I didn't know that, I'll be honest. I wouldn't have mm -hmm. thought that you could do it with preschool kids. So I learned something new today too. Um, how did how did you guys you know fall into the self-monitoring world? Mm -hmm. Like what, what brought you into being so passionate about this? <laughs> It's kind of a cute story because we kind of landed there from two different worlds and I'll start the story and then I'll punt it over to Katie. I was at Lehigh University doing my 
school psychology and my BCBA concurrently at the same time. And one of my mentors is, is Dr. Ed Shapiro, the late Dr. Ed Shapiro, who was a huge pillar in self-monitoring in the school psych field and before I was born. And, and I just fell in love with this area of, of, of research. I was researching it. I was doing my um, thesis on self-monitoring with individuals with autism. And then when I was doing my internship, I was put on a, a dual assignment. I was put on an internship for my school psych and then also um, an internship for my BCBA. And so here I was coming in like fresh and green and young, loving self-monitoring. And then into our interns or our intern supervisor's office walks Katie and tell us more <laughs> from there, Katie. <laughs> yeah. So I was in a totally different program um, at Temple University in Philadelphia and my mentor there was Dr. Saul Axelrod. And he had connected me with another wonderful behavior analyst, Dr. Kelly McElrath. And she was working in the Bucks County Intermediate Unit in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And so I got assigned to her to do my internship. And then <laughs> I walk in and there's Jamie, who I hadn't met yet. Uh, but we were paired together and Kelly supervised the both of us for our, our uh, hours for supervision to become a behavior analyst. Um, and when we were there, they said, you know, why don't you guys go into this classroom and support this teacher? And so we went into a classroom to start supporting a teacher. And we were talking about what could we do in this classroom? And she started talking about self-monitoring. And I'm like, well, I'm learning about self-monitoring too. So why don't we figure out if we can do something to support the students in this classroom using self-monitoring? And that's kind of where it started. And then and we're talking like mm -hmm. 2005. So talk about grassroots. The, the progress we saw in this class was amazing. And then it kind of from there grew. And we would start getting little training opportunities where we'd be going to Staples and making these little notebooks that now turned into our 200 page manual. Um, but what we saw from this kind of grassroots effort was if you can work with teachers, if you can get their buy-in, if you can work with the students directly and get their voice, that you do see huge changes. And some of those nuggets, Katie, that came out of that first one that we still talk about in our stories is this was an amazing teacher. We're still in touch with her. Mm -hmm. She's retired now, but um, she had like a, a laundry list of things that she wanted to work on with her kids because she had um, a classrooms of really... Um, highly behavioral kids. And we would say to her, well, let's pick our biggest fish to fry. Like we can't go through all seven things at once. So we would say, okay, let's make our first self and match forms with four areas to work on and one attainable question so that we can always make sure to give the student positive feedback and praise. And then from there kind of faded it in different ways. So, but yeah, it was over 15, 16, 17 years ago. The teacher then shared this system that we had created in her classroom with other teachers. And then the other teachers were like, Katie and Jamie, can you come help in my classroom? And so that was in one school district. And then we started getting calls from other teachers who worked for the intermediate unit in other school districts and was like, can you come to our classroom? And then when Jamie and I finished our grad school programs, we both got hired by the intermediate unit and Jamie went to the upper part of the county and I went to the lower part of the county. And then in our respective roles, we started developing self and match systems to support the teachers that we were supporting in those areas. And then Jamie decided she was going to leave me and go back to California, which was so sad, but, <laughs> but also 75 time. degrees most of the year. You can't, you can't blame anyone for moving to Santiago. I know. It's just like no. But I was able to then slide into Jamie's position in the upper part of the county. And so the systems that she had started for kiddos when they were in, you know, kinder, first, second, third, I got to see all the way through high school with them. So it was amazing to see how we can continue to evolve and grow the students and change the system to support them as they transition through their school age. And Katie, um, can I point out the system that you put in place as a kindergartner would not be the same system you would have in place in a high schooler, because even if it's the same student and you're using self a match across their educational career, you're you're constantly fine tuning it. So the areas that you're targeting as a, as a young child are likely not the same things you're tar targeting as they get older. The frequency of check-ins when they were a preschool or a kinder first grader, we might have been checking in every 30 minutes because that's what they needed 
by high school, you might just check in once at the end of the period, or maybe you're just checking in once at the end of the day. We've had adult transition students do one check in a week. So it's something where even Katie alluded that we do have students that have used self and match throughout their career. What you'll see is that it's thinned and it's faded and it's changed as, as the student makes progress because you're constantly, um, one of the key things you're thinking about with this intervention is how can I fade it? How can I get it to a point where the student has um, self-monitored? And I, one of the beauties of self-monitoring is it is a generalization procedure because everywhere we go, we're there. So, you know, with the token board or marble system, they're looking for us to give feedback with self-monitoring. They're with themselves everywhere they go. And so our, our goal with our students is always to fade out ourselves and what they need from us. And that's one of the beauties of the system. Well, if you think about it, I mean, we're all self-monitoring to a certain extent. We may not have a checklist or a written checklist, but, you know, we talk about rule-governed behavior. And before this webinar, we were just talking a little bit about, ooh, like I broke the rules, I got a parking ticket, or I, I, I did this, or I did that, right? But for the most part, you know, we all have some type of self-monitoring check-in. And I love that, you know, self and match really is looking for that and looking to just, hey, let's generalize this. Um <laughs> I do have a confession to make. So my confession is that I use self-monitoring now and I love it. I love self and match. I love how easy it is to implement. Um, but when I used to think about self-monitoring, I used to get really overwhelmed because I knew the research behind it. I knew it worked, but I didn't quite know how to implement it. And I, okay, this might be a good intervention, but uh, I'm not quite sure how it works. And, you know, Katie, before, when you were describing it, it sounds amazing. But what I love the most about the actual manual of self and match is that you have so many examples in there that it's just easy. It's like you're giving somebody the tools. So, you know, if I was feeling overwhelmed or someone else was like, yeah, this is great, but ha, ha, where do I start? Ha, I know this is going to work, but where? Um, you can just hand that over. And, you know, I think a lot of our members are also feeling that way. You know, we get a lot of questions about self-monitoring and do you have any examples, et cetera. And I'm so happy that we met you because you're doing a webinar for us in another Yay! week from now. So yes. November 8th, um, at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, you two are doing a webinar for us on self and match um, and how to use a self monitoring system and how to set it up and go from nothing to something to effective. Um, so I'm so excited. Um, and that's going to live in our CEUs then for another month. So if you can't catch us live, you can catch it asynchronous. So tell us what else like we can expect on that webinar in terms of like what, what our members will learn on self and match. So absolutely. So what we were planning on doing for that webinar is we want to give people tools they can take away immediately. We want to make that webinar as hands-on and like, we're ready to go. I'm not worried. I'm not afraid of self-monitoring anymore. So what our thought was, is we will not go dive deep into self and match because typically for self and match, you want to own a manual and we want our, our webinar to be beyond just, you need to buy a manual. We want you, whether you're going to buy a self and match manual or not, we want you to start loving self monitoring as a tool. So we're going to go through the who's of self monitoring, who can do it in even more detail than we did today. The what's of self monitoring, the where's, because we didn't even talk about all the where's, the why's, and we're going to get into the core of the why's. We're going to go through some of that research of why, why, what, what is out there that's telling us this is a tool. And then we're going to spend time talking about how's and those how's will not just be self and match. Those how's will be, you want to set up a self monitoring system. You do or don't have the manual. It's fine. Here are some tools that you can add to your toolbox to get it set up. Um, so that's our vision. Kitty, is there anything I missed on that? Yeah, I think the really important thing there too is to make sure that all of your um, members have an understanding of why self-monitoring is so important. And I think that helps them to communicate to their teams why we might try this intervention. Because like you mentioned, it is one of those things that I think people think of and they think, yeah, I want to do this, but I don't know exactly how. So token economies are so much easier, right? We don't want people to always rely on that one token economy intervention, uh, it's great, right? But there are other things that are out there. And for us, we always tell people, our job is to work ourselves out of a job. If we implement a token economy, we will always be reliant on an adult being delivering that token, right? But if you can implement self-monitoring, we can figure out how to fade ourselves out, which makes our students more independent, less reliant on us, we reduce some of that prompt dependency that we sometimes see in our learners. And so we want to explain to you 
why you should be using self-monitoring systems so you can communicate that back to your teams that you're supporting as well. And then, like Jamie said, the hows, you know, what are some, you know, go to quick uh, tools to learn how to implement self-monitoring so that you feel like when you leave after listening to us, one, you're super empowered so that you feel like, yes, I can do self-monitoring. And two, you have a couple of different avenues that you can investigate to start using self-monitoring tomorrow. So we mentioned, you know, the manual, what is available for people who are interested in, you know, either attending the webinar and learning more or, you know, buying your products, how can they access it? Absolutely. So there's a bunch of different ways. We do have some distributors that have self match available that you might come across, but the easiest way is probably to go straight to our website. And I'm hoping today you'll have that linked right at the bottom of, um, along with our web, our podcast, but okay. yes, there is, um, you can purchase the manual straight from our website. The beauty of doing it that way is it'll get shipped right to you. And as Shana mentioned, what's fun about the manual is we don't want people to be scared of self-monitoring. We don't want people to be like, this is too overwhelming. How do I even make the forms? The forms look great, but I don't know how to get there. And when we first started this, we were saying, here's everything you need to know. Good luck. And then <laughs> as time went on, people are like, I'm just not computer savvy. Can you make the forms for me? And we'd be like, sure, here you go. And then we realized, no, so many people want to be empowered to make these forms and they want to be able to do it themselves and they want to add visuals and they want to add different materials. So we created an online forms portal and also a self and matchmaker app, which is a, not an app, that was a wrong word choice, but a website where you can download a PDF of a self and match. So what's neat about that now is there's basically five ways you can make the forms. You can open up a Word document, make it yourself. You can email us and say, hey, can you send me sample 17 in the book? We'll email it over to you. But you can also download these Excel document versions, these Word document versions, or the digital self and match where you can do everything online or that PDF creator. So um, I just kind of wanted to mention when you're buying the manual, you're not just getting the physical manual, you're also getting access to these online portals as well. And I think the other beautiful thing is that Jamie and I are a two-man show. We we do everything for um, for self and match, and we answer every email that every single person sends us. And because I'm on the East Coast and she's on the West Coast, we basically say we're available 24 hours a day. So if you email us, <laughs> somebody is going to get back to you, and it's going to be one of us. And we're happy to troubleshoot, and we're happy to answer questions. You know that is what we're here for. So we get excited when people are excited about self and match and want to learn more. Wow. And we are going to be sharing a page on our website where people can also purchase the self and match um, in our e-store that will be in the show notes. But, and part of the reason that we, you know, we're so excited about partnering with you guys and hosting you on our webinar is, you know, your passion for this topic really comes across. And the fact that like you guys have been building this, I think since 2005, Mm -hmm. um, and it's really been not even your full-time job. And, you know, you guys are the ones responding to the emails and, um, you know, you really built this up. It's not easy to like do something as like a side gig after you have a full-time job. And I'm sure you put everything you had to that full-time job. Two kids also. each <laughs> we had our kids and our lives. And yes, absolutely. Yeah. So it's so clear that you really want to help the, you know, the mm -hmm. ABA community and, um, students in general and teachers really do the best that they can. And so I think that that's amazing. And we're so excited to be getting to know you guys. Oh, we're excited to meet you guys too. And I think the other thing that's fun for young behavior analysts new to this field is that this came out of like schoolwork for us. This came out of us being assigned to this location for our internship and having the opportunity to create a project that really stemmed out of us learning how to become behavior analysts. And so I always tell my students and when I talk to, you know, new behavior analysts, don't dismiss opportunities that you have. You never know when this is going to lead you to your, you know, your partner for the rest of your life to, you know, work side by <laughs> side with. Yeah, exactly. And it's so much fun when you get to work with the people that, you know, are your best friends and, and get to do something that you're super passionate about. And so I, you know, I love that piece of our story too, that it came out of something that we were doing for school, but then it ended up being so much more. So Wow. That's such a nice story. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> um, so where can people find out um, more? You'll share your website. Are you guys? Absolutely. On? Yeah. Our website is very easy. 
It's www.selfandmatch.com. And that's an and, A-N-D. And um, all of the different um, social media networks were very similar. So we're on Facebook, you know, self match and Twitter, self match and very soon Instagram. I, people have been pushing me. I just haven't gotten there yet. Um, Get on there. LinkedIn, we're on LinkedIn. Um, so I'm sure you can put all those links on, yes. on the page too. And please keep in touch with us. We love hearing from folks. So if you do watch today's webinar and you have questions, please, as Katie mentioned, reach out and one of the two of us will get right back to you. And Jamie, Katie, we're so excited to have you in another week from now for the webinar, yes. Tuesday, November 8th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, all about self-monitoring. So I'm so excited to continue this conversation then. Thanks so much. Thank you. We'll see you then.